Um, thank you very much, John. Welcome, everybody. Congratulations, Ken and John, on putting together the, the wonderful forum. Looking forward to hearing from people today. Uh, I guess I'm the sort of tame semi-economist that you normally open up these types of sessions with. I used to be a geophysicist. It's not actually a picture of me on the right. It looks a little bit more like me on the left these days in terms of... Uh, so I encourage people into the, into the discipline of mineral economics. It's actually quite a nice lifestyle field. Um, for some reason, however, that you could probably count the mineral economists in Australia on the fingers of one hand. You've obviously seen Richard Shoddy. I'm sure we'll see many of Richard's slides uh, during the day. Um, so for some reason, we're not actually attracting people through into this particular discipline, even though the amount that we need to do in terms of understanding the impact of of economics on, on exploration is massive. The short line conclusion was we, we probably don't know anything. We're at the stage where we almost don't know what we don't know, if you like, at the present time. I have some co-authors, John Sykes, who I like to call the sort of Nick Kyrgios of Mineral Economics. He's at the CET, he's a PhD student, trying to work out what the next generation copper mine will look like, what's the, what's the most economic style of mineralization. Uh, John can't be with us today, uh, he's traveling, but uh, Matt Kanakis, who Unfortunately, he's gone over to the downside to, to, uh, to, to KPMG, a uh, recent graduate out of the CET. I'll show you some of uh, Matt's work from his honours thesis. Uh, and again, uh, it's, it probably tells you something that a great piece of work in an honours thesis is actually quite groundbreaking in this field. And I'll show you some data that Matt put together on, on the sort of costs versus geological parameters of the Australian gold industry that really threw up a few things that we haven't expected over 100 years of mining gold plus in Australia. Uh, we're only now starting to get our head around uh, geologically what, what the difference between a quality deposit and a less quality deposit. I'll try and show you some of those data. Um, we all bring biases to, to talks like this uh, from our past experience. Um, uh, that clearly, I think, influences the outcome. We need to be aware of that. Uh, uh, was once a geophysicist, I actually unfortunately dropped my ASCG membership these days. But the biases I bring are probably very much underground from the nickel business in WMC uh, and the gold business there and watching the different profitabilities of those divisions over time. Um, also for, for, from the gold business having worked at the Super Pit in Galgoolie for, for a time, and that was a time at Mount Shell, that was up really underground there as, as well. And then a bit of management speak from McKinsey, a bit of oil and gas perspective of things always quite handy. And then more recently looking at the copper industry in particular in, in Chile and the issues around transitioning from open pit to underground in Chile there, for example. Um, which is not as, obviously, in magnitude terms is, is an acute problem for Chile, but that's just because they're a third plus of the copper industry. But if you actually look at the comparison of Chile to, to Australia, we've got more of, an, of a going underground, uh, to quote Paul Weller, I suppose, um, uh, problem here in, in Australia than they actually have in Chile, even though some of the the mines are going underground there. So the bias is very much an Australian bias. It's, it's an underground operator's bias to a degree, and a little bit of Chilean copper bias in what I'll tell you today. Um, Mike Dentist up next. And Mike's always very candid and, and controversial as a speaker, so I thought I'd do my best to emanate uh, Mike and be opinionated at the start of the talk. So um, here's some opinions from me. Some of them are backed up by fact. They're certainly all backed up by bias. Um, it's, it's, it's possible to make any project look pretty simple on a spreadsheet. That's the nice thing about mineral economics. You don't have to leave the office. You just sort of turn on Excel and the world's a wonderful place. Um, reality is obviously clearly far more complex than that. We're discovering that when you actually try and compare models to actual real data. Uh, there's typically a linear uh, sanctity of grade, I call it, built into mineral economic models. When I show you some of the Matt Kanakis' work, so, we haven't yet beyond, got really far beyond sort of size and grade uh, as parameters in, in, in the mineral economic space when we model things. Clearly, you need grade for a mine. I haven't yet come across a mine that had no grade in it. But it's, you know, the, the sanctity of grade is probably not quite as important as we think uh, it is. But the fun, actually, and the important lesson here for geophysicists is what comes out of some of Matt's work. And it will differ from commodity and mineralization style to mineralization style. But certainly in Australian gold, um, the actual shape and the mineralization style of the ore bodies in terms of their control on the cost function, believe it or not, looks actually more important than grade. And that's actually quite interesting for geophysics in the fact that uh, imaging shape and understanding mineralization style is something I think that's easier to, to actually image inverted commas from geophysics than maybe direct grade. So there's a lot more geometry and scale effects are important. Um, Cost modeling, uh, I'm lucky for a CRU, Commodity Research Unit affiliation, to get access to lots and lots of 
across models, across 30 or 40 different commodities. Uh, we tend to get underground more, wrong more often than we get uh, pitch wrong, which is more variables underground. Uh, a lot of the economics challenges suffer from some of the ambiguity challenges as do geophysics. There's a whole, there's a whole PhD in it, sort of analogies were otherwise there. Um, maybe we're, we're probably a little bit better off on occasions than geophysics if we don't suffer the, the many orders of magnitude problems that geophysics suffers sometimes in better physical properties, but we, we do still have order of magnitude problems in terms of putting the right costs on things. And we have the same black box challenges as, as geophysics in the fact that you can make a model but sometimes people don't actually realise what it does and what the assumptions are in the model and they end up getting quite circular very quickly. Uh, and the other thing is definitions. I think we've probably got more of a problem there in, in economics. Uh, one of the phrases I like to say is this, you know, this, this, um, this lies, um, uh, what is it, damned lies, uh, and there's uh, mining costs, I think. So that's the, that's the way that one goes. And so th those are my sort of biases in terms of the conclusions. We've got a long, long way to go. But somehow I managed to come up with 30 slides of, of where we've actually got to. So we must have actually done something. So. Um, what are we looking for? Well, clearly we're all looking for new quality discoveries. What quality actually is is a big question, so you know where you are on the cost curve, whether that's an operating cost curve or whether it's a full economic cost curve, including uh, capital de uh, depreciation and capital charges. We'll get different answers for, for different types of cost curve. Um, but clearly, sometimes quality will be high grade and deep underground, other times it might actually be lower grade and uh, but a nice shape underground that allows for economy of scale that gives you a better overall economic outcome. How do we get there? We need to, I think, get a little bit beyond models. There's lots of facts out there in terms of the mineral economics rules. There's lots of mines around the world that we can try and understand the cost functions on. And it's far quicker to build a model that's rubbish than it is to actually get real data to actually try and come up with something a little bit more intelligent. So what I've tried to do here is, is give you a couple of examples of hopefully being a little bit more intelligent rather than just building a size grade depth model of what might work because those don't work and I'm not sure you why they don't work. Um, a lot of lot of work to do so if anybody wants to uh, light up the guards and put their feet up on the table and watch the screen and become a mineral economic, an economist then uh, we, we certainly need your help. Uh, this is to offend all the mining engineers in the room, this is a sort of cartoon of, of the mining of a porphyry. Um, uh, this obviously comes from, from a chilly background, as it were, a enriched cap, perhaps with some low grade underneath. If you're really lucky, there might be a blind, sort of high grade pod down there somewhere. And, and obviously, we want to try and mine that. And if we've got some smart mining engineers, they'll, they'll bring forward the high grade as fast as they can. Within a mine, within a mine, grade matters. Between mines, we tend to unfortunately lose the advantage of grade. That's the, that's the takeaway uh, here. And I'll show you some data for that. So I'll just repeat that. Within a mine, grade matters. We've got to actually do work on that. Clearly, if you're mining something, you can go into a higher grade stoke or a higher grade bench. That makes a big impact on your cash flow. If you're just looking at grade and tonnages between mines, unfortunately, blame the engineers or anybody else, or blame the, the sort of geology of the planet, the complexity is actually engineer away some of that grade advantage, unfortunately. Uh, but then, if we go down and get the good stuff, and then if, if Commodity prices are kind to us, we take the, the sort of lower grade, deeper stuff towards the end of the mine life, and what we end up with is a grade function like that, some sort of cost function that goes the other way, but, but, but it's vastly oversimplified here in the fact that clearly there's a, there's a mining response, particularly in the open pit uh, environment here. If you're fortunate enough to have uh, different byproducts, for example, you can take perhaps higher grade aluminum, higher grade uh, gold benches within the whole copper system, for example, there. Sometimes you have that flexibility on the ground. Generally speaking, you don't have as much flexibility on the ground. Uh, the problem we've got is we don't really understand the grade cost function um, for different mineralization styles and between different commodities when we're doing our economic models. And that's a problem because grades actually vary an enormous lot. And this is just obviously the copper world with porphyries in, uh, in red here and with sedimentary coppers in, in uh, sort of, uh, what is it, dockers purple, I suppose. Um, so if we don't understand uh, the impact of grades on costs, then we've got a real problem because grades vary a great deal. Um, what we do know, though, is, is over time, as a portfolio, grades tend to fall, and we've seen this in many forms uh, over the years. So you'll see grade decline within a particular mine, and you'll see grade decline over the portfolio of mines within a particular commodity. You need to be able to model that in. The interesting thing there is, we've now got to the stage, at least within CRU, that we actually now understand the grade decline function for the different styles of mineralization talking copper, so certainly in the copper world, in terms of the, the fact that VMSs, for example, you get the grade decline a lot quicker than you do in porphyries, but that you do get the compound, it's about 
1% of the grade per annum per, uh, over the life of the porphyry asset. This is typically the grade decline that, that reasonably fits the data. Uh, sedimentary coppers tend to actually hold up in grade far better. So you've got to try and get to that level of understanding before you actually start to put those things uh, into your model. Um, having worked at Cambalda on nickel, that's, that's fun because uh, you know, the good news about that is you mine about 50 different shoots, probably higher now at Cambalda over the years. You can tell, you, you know that the average shoots a million tons at 3%. Grade does matter, I think, suspect a lot more in, in nickel underground than in gold. Um, and, you, and after you've mined 50 shoots, you can see the grade peaks in year two, um, tonnage peaks in year five of typically a 13 year mine life for a, a Cambelda nickel sulfide underground mine. So you've actually got enough empirical data to do something with when it actually comes to, to modeling that mine empirically rather than just making a, a load of rubbish in Excel as well. Um, what we unfortunately can't do when we're going underground uh, in, in the decades to come is rely upon uh, ever rising commodity prices to sort of bail out the economics, if you like. This is 100 years of, of real and nominal copper prices, real in, in the red, and depending on which generation you were brought up as a mineral economist, you either felt that uh, real commodity prices either rose if you were, if you were taught before uh, the mid 1970s at 2% compound per annum, and you had two or three decades where most of the mineral economists are now have been taught that real commodity prices fall in real terms by about 2% compound per annum. Then of course we've had the China miracle, put the whole thing together and I think that the general consensus is now a flat reel going forward, but it's obviously a sort of a, a competition between technology and, and labor costs and energy costs principally. So we can't rely on higher prices to bail us out basically uh, going forward. We do need to solve the, 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 the grade problem. Uh, most of, I've used copper again as the example here. Um, you know, Low grade, low grade is the new high grade, so to speak. In, in Chile, you know, 0.6 perfectly decent in Chile. We tend to turn our nose up at it here in, in Australia, but uh, certainly in the Chilean coastal range, you do very well with a 0.6, 0.1 uh, copper gold system. The key point here is that low grades are here to stay. We need to understand the economics uh, of low grade mining. Quite frankly, we can't uh, rely on grade to bail us out. But as I show you, in certain mineralization styles, grade may not be all that much of a help anyway. Uh, I'd probably think. Um, I, I suspect we're probably overcalling it a little bit in terms of saying there's a massive crisis right now at, at the present time. If you actually look at the copper project pipeline here for the different countries uh, around the planet, uh, you can see why Australia is probably shouting a little bit louder than most in terms of we need to understand undercover and we need to understand underground economics of things. But uh, you know, Chile and Peru are basically countries built on uh, sterilisation drilling. You'll normally find some copper somewhere. Um, so the opportunities there are five, six-fold what they are everywhere else on, on the planet. I'll, I'll show you that. But, and most of those opportunities, as you can see here, are still open, pitiful opportunities. That's only what we can see, though. It doesn't mean to say we're not going to find better and bigger things uh, undercover than, than the current project pipeline. This is a really scary chart. Um, this is what the project pipeline looks like. And it looks like, I did this about 18 months ago, in terms of what you can see going forward. And it shows the existing dominance of Chile, the chances of Peru catching up with Chile in terms of uh, copper output. And it shows that we're really uh, down the bottom of the, of the list in terms of what you can visibly see as the upside in Australia. So we've got a lot of, a lot of work to do there. And again, that's why we need to go undercover here. Let's try and understand the, the economics of mining then, uh, underground versus open pit. And again, this is somewhat assumption based. <coughs> Don't, I don't like having assumptions in models, but the, the, the strip ratio type assumption here of, of cost, I think it's probably one of the better assumptions in there. So as the strip ratio goes up, obviously your costs per all time um, uh, go up as well. And then you can look at the different styles of underground mining available to you. And uh, the unfortunate thing is obviously in a particular ore body, depending on the geometry, you may use four or five styles of underground mining in one particular uh, ore body. So that's where the challenges start to come in to actually model these things. If you listen to Newcrest a few years ago, we're saying that, uh, um, that the underground block caving, which, which sort of looks good on here, could compete with you know, fairly low strip ratios of, of open pits. And that's sort of quite good, but, the, but the, the numbers they talk about, and you can talk about whether it's two to one, whether it's three to one in that order, and whether you talk about CapEx uh, competitiveness or OPEX competitiveness, the project pipeline in, in copper for porphyries, um, you, you know, three quarters of the project pipeline has a strip ratio under one. So where that's telling you is in copper, going underground is going to be more expensive, everything else being equal than, than in open pits. And I'll show you a cost curve that actually reflects that in copper. Um, 
particularly when you get things like low energy prices, for example, as we've got the present time. So here is a cost curve for copper. Apologies, this is a bit faint. Um, the, the, this, this here, this is the underground cost curve in light blue. Um, those operations that have underground and, and, and uh, open pit operations are in the orange, and, and the predominant copper from the world comes from open pits, which is the sort of dark blue cost curve. So what this is telling you is, representing it this way, it's telling you that, that yes, there is a cost penalty to mine copper underground, and, and there it is. So, so in terms of actually modeling what something might look like, I'd personally like to have a look at some real data, and actually, you know, we can, we can analyze the depth of these underground operations, look at the cost of those, and actually effectively mine, mine the data to come up with real analogs for uh, exploration targets. But at the moment, unfortunately, in copper, uh, underground is less competitive than is uh, open pits. In nickel, of course, it's the other way around, courtesy in part of grade and courtesy in part of, of nickel sulfides versus nickel laterites. So if you did the same chart for nickel, uh, you actually see the underground actually beats open pits in nickel. So that's where, again, this horse is, of course, is in different commodities, and that's a very simple example of mineralization style. Obviously, we could get a lot more complicated than that. Uh, where, where should we be doing this more than others? And again, this is where grade does matter, and value counts per, per ton of material. So clearly, the red here is the proportion of, of, of uh, underground mining for the different commodities. The green is the proportion of open pit mining for different commodities. And you can very clearly see we're talking about the precious, precious metals world of the and the base metals world in terms of under, understanding uh, underground economics. And, and again, this is a different way of showing it, just for platinum, nickel, and clearly uh, iron ore having trouble making money with large scale open pits at the moment, let alone uh, trying to go underground. So, how do we get there? Uh, let me tell you a quick story. This is courtesy of Matt Kanakis, so that's the back of the room. Uh, the Australian gold industry, again, without sounding alarmist, I, I, I do think has some challenges ahead of it. Um, gold price, we know, have risen since the old days of $250 an ounce, you might remember, in the 1990s through to the $1,200 now. And in Aussie dollar terms, we, we picked up at the $1,900 Aussie a couple of years ago. And the problem has been, of course, that costs have chased us all the way up that, uh, that sort of rise in, in, in prices. And despite all that massive rise in prices, we've not been able to increase output from Australian gold mines sort of effectively at all um, over the last sort of 15, 20 years. So it's quite scary. I do think there's a rise and stall type challenge in Australian gold. In fact, we might be looking at a South African type rise and fall situation if we're not careful. So clearly we need to understand what works in terms of economics of Australian gold. So apologies for just a set of numbers on there, but, but the headlines are an interesting one. There's around about 50 mines in Australia for gold, that includes three in New Zealand, as it turns out. And the rough underground to open pit split is about 50-50, depending on how you do it. You can get 55-45, which is a little bit like sort of the uh, Liberals and Labour. It sort of flips around one way or the other at certain times. Um, grades vary absolutely enormously, enormously from things like Andy Well, which is double digit. Obviously, that's Doria Minerals up in the Murchison 12 grants per ton, down to sort of Cady Hill when you're in the sort of copper gold world with, with, with copper credits there. And then I've talked about lies, damn lies, and mining costs, and then you have to then unravel what the costs actually mean. You can either do that yourself, or you can take the company's word for it. The reporting is actually getting clearer, but it's still hard to understand uh, the reporting of costs. The case study I'll show you is based on reported costs, and it's based on the uh, latest all-in sustaining cost type definitions in the industry, which have prevailed for the last couple of years. So I've asked you to say, what does a production cost versus grade chart look like for Australian gold mines? You, you might guess something like this, so you know, higher, higher cost, um, lower grade, higher grade, lower cost. And that would be the sort of function that you actually get out of most economic models when you were trying to model exploration targets. That's baked in. Okay. So that's baked in. The data, of course, looks nothing like that. Data looks like that. Okay. So it's, it's just nothing there of that relationship at all. So somehow that great advantage has actually been you know, dissipated in some way, shape, or form. And we can argue that smarter people in the room than me in terms of statistics that can work out whether there are trends there or, other, or otherwise. But uh, it certainly doesn't look anything like that in terms of the, the actual uh, grade versus cost function. So. The interesting thing was this is real data. This was from, let's say, from, from Matt's thesis. This is the end of 2013, second half data, also in Q4 2013. You can look at us all in sustaining. You can look at, look at cash costs. You can look at the full half year. You can look at the quarter. You, you basically, you can't plan it. So you can't see grade. 
you can't see grade in the economics of things in open pit and you can't see grade in the underground. So how can that be? How the hell can you model something when you can't hang the model off grade? So that's the challenge that we've actually got. So let's have a look. You can say, okay, well let's have a look at deposit type. Well that's a bit of fun. So you spend a fair bit of time looking at deposit type and you get out at the end of the day, you get absolutely nothing out of that either. So deposit type doesn't help. It does help you in some things. Obviously we've talked about laterites versus sulfites and nickel being an obvious example where deposit types helps you and then in zinc there are, there are various types of deposit you wouldn't bother to go out looking for, there are the ones that are actually reasonably uh, attractive. Um, so what about mineralization style then? So this is a, sim a simplified version, again I apologize to be a bit, a bit um, fuzzy there for you, but there are either sort of various discrete style like the bottom left hand side of just a, sort of a, a single nice vein, thank you very much, or, or there are more uh, dispersed styles of mineralization where you're actually getting mineralization beyond the actual good material out into the wall rocks and the like in various ways, shapes or forms. You can actually have a look at that. Um, you actually get something there, believe it or not. So you can't actually see grade, but you can actually see mineralization style. And the dis dispersed, disseminated styles of mineralization actually populate in the lower quartiles. So this is the, this is the sort of famed lowest cost quartile of the, in this case, of the Australian gold industry. This is where 75% of companies always say they're in the lowest cost quartile of the industry. The other 25% say they'll be there next year. Um, <laughs> but the, clearly, you know, the data are showing that the, the dispersed styles of mineralization seem to populate in the lowest cost and the next quartile, even though you can't see the grade effect. That's actually amazing as a finding. Now, the fact we haven't done this work for 100 years is, in the gold industry amazes me. But anyway, let's have a look at another one. Geometry matters as well. So maybe you can't see grade, but you can define things geometrically. And this is the fun for geophysicists, I think. Geophysics, we can actually image geometry. And I think here, what we're saying here, there are three just definitions here equidimensional, sort of planar or, or more sort of cylindrical pencil shaped door bodies. Who wins? And, and equidimensional uh, all bodies win. I think that's partly a scale effect that un underlies that. A separate study the previous year looked at the differences between o open pit costs and underground costs, a little bit like the data you saw there, but from the previous year's data, came up with the answer that there was no statistical difference between them. The interesting thing out of that study came up with if you actually had, if you had a hybrid operation between open pit and underground, you actually paid about $150 an ounce cost penalty for that extra complexity of the operation, which might be something to do with having different um, uh, fleets of equipment from underground and open pit, for example, interestingly. So this is just the empirical ways of looking at things. The funny thing is, amazing that you can see geometry, amazing that you can see mineralization style when you can't see grade in the cost data. Why is that? So I've said to try and hit the conclusion of that particular aspect of the talk, um, I think it's to say, within a mine, clearly it matters. We need to do more work on that. We can do that for, for any of the 50 gold mines and look at their cost function by you know, the, the type of mining at the different stokes and the weighted average of, of styles of mining across the operation um, versus the grade from those different stokes. And you should see that function. You'd expect to see it. Um, but between mines, every time we put out a thing saying we've got in exploration a high grade intersection somewhere or other, it really doesn't matter. The investors might like it or otherwise, but what really matters is the geometry. And I've just obviously, um, we've made up something slightly uh, perverse here, if you like, that we've got an example of engineering away the grade advantage in an underground operation with all the extra capital development and awkwardness of the mining. So I'm not trying to blame the engineers, but the data, one explanation of the data is this. Um, Clearly we need to understand the different cost drivers and they differ by different underground mining style and they differ clearly between open pit and underground. Um, and for example, you know, what we're seeing now in terms of lower diesel costs and the like actually favours uh, the higher proportion of uh, diesel costs in open pit mining. Obviously, um, if it was labour costs, you'd go a higher proportion of labour costs in you know, underground mining. So we need to understand those cost functions and get those into the model properly. So where do we go from here? Um, we had a bit of a play. We took those 50 mines of data and we sort of made up we did what I've sort of said almost that you shouldn't do and make up a, a very, very simplistic, overly simplistic model. And we sort of, sort of polished the greens, perhaps not the easiest to see here, but this is something like a medium type uh, um, gold mine in the data for open pit. It's sort of a typical medium type uh, underground gold mine. Might be a little bit skewed by the fact that it does take in some of the copper golds here. But, and basically what you end up with is, is about sort of three times the size uh, underground to, to surface of what's actually being mined right now. That's what's being mined right now. 
So everything else being equal, that starts to tell me that sort of the target size underground is maybe of, of the order of three times in Australian gold at least as, as an equivalent uh, economic uh, uh, open pit pro proposition. And, and the grade, as it turns out, even though we can't see the grade the relationship there clearly, the, the data, we obviously have the data of what the grades are, and they're again of the order of, of three times. So it's almost a three and three rule here, three times the size, three times the grade. Um, it looks like sort of the way that the relationship just in Australian gold happens to be working. It may not hold for African gold, it's a completely different cost function in terms of labour, energy, etc. Um, so let's have a bit of a play with that. We also, as exploration companies, we're not allowed to anymore, but we, people used to talk about in ground values of things. That was always quite good fun. Remember those things? We'd go out to say those. And billions and billions of dollars of in ground value. Well, let's, let's quickly destroy that. So we've got in ground reserve, we've got to convert that, make some assumptions, resource reserve conversions. Change that number for, for open pet versus underground. We've obviously made up some numbers here of sort of 70% and 50%. Um, once we've converted that, we then will have some mining losses. Again, we've made up some numbers, but empirically we can actually find out what the real mining losses are, uh, so we can put that into the data. Um, we've then obviously got to uh, process the thing, which is luckily, generally speaking, fairly easy in, in gold. Couldn't find a difference, by the way, between uh, free milling gold costs and refractory gold costs in the data. That was another interesting uh, side of things. But any which way, we've got some processing costs to handle. Um, then we've got the time value of things and the fact that there's revenues and costs we need to account for. So we can effectively just look at the, the time value of the, of the revenues based on some uh, delay to actually build the operation and bring it back. Um, eventually there, we will we'll get down to actually the um, well, oh, sorry, this is, revenues aren't profits, aren't they? That's right, it's the, this thing called cost we're going to take off first. So we have to work out the, the time value of the actual margin, and then eventually we get down to actually what the actual project's worth. And on, on those assumptions, um, you don't actually lose, you need that three times three multiple to get to the same value based on the assumption we've made in this little simple uh, example. So there's no, you don't lose value by going underground. The problem is you obviously need three times the target size and three times the grade to make it all work. So those are the sorts of numbers. Now if we had actually better factual data, we could perhaps put some better data into the model uh, to do that. But what it's sort of saying is there's no particular penalty in value terms for, for being underground versus being um, uh, open pit in Australian gold as long as you have the median uh, underground deposit and the median uh, open pit deposit compared. And there's any number of uh, PhDs and master's thesis to have a look at what the real distributions are there. So where we will likely mislead you as mineral economists going forward, and I'm sure you'll see plenty of them, uh, is oversimplistic economic models of, of, of underground targets for exploration. Just showed you that, that we only scratched the surface here and showed you it's exactly difficult. All economic assumptions with limited geology and mining inputs, so we really need to get the real numbers in there. Uh, hard wiring of a simple grade and size and nothing else. Um, into the economics to the exclusion of complexity and scale effects, saw body shape and minimization style. Uh, limited factual analysis of existing underground deposits and their economics versus pit deposits. The wonderful thing is we've got all this data around the world. Certainly CRU have the data. You have to be careful of some of the CRU models because they some of them have assumptions built into them. The gold industry is quite nice to study because it actually is fairly transparent in cost reporting. Uh, copper perhaps a little bit less so. Um, um, but you've got a chance. And then there's, there's various uh, modified factors that one needs to build into the analysis um, by understanding the actual all things like the um, mineral policy, royalties, all the rest of it for particular targets. So the final word, unfortunately, I've, I've stolen from Cameron Quay. It applies to mineral economics the same as it probably, I think, you originally quote it in terms of mineral systems. But as analysts, we're still in the 1800s uh, by our analogs stuffing birds, and we really need to. Sort of, forge our way towards uh, mapping the genome. So we've certainly got a lot of work ahead of us and uh, we would like help to get there. There's the contact details of my uh, co-authors and there's some, uh, we've made some start on this, so there's some uh, reading which may or may not prove uh, useful to you there. Um, that's all I have time to speak to, so I'll give five minutes left. <laughs> Thanks, Alan. People, there's about six seats at the front. Um, we've got some time for questions, but we'll just, if you want to plow your way forward, you're welcome to occupy these. I think they'll be close to the screen. Always keeps you from falling asleep. Um, any questions?
Actually, Alan, I've got one. Just um, early on, you said um, you talking about cost modelling gets underground wrong. Is it particularly wrong one way or the other? Or oh, great, good question. Uh, that actually, that came out of a conversation with some of the CRU cost models uh, in, in preparing the presentation. I, I, I think if there was a bias, but it's not been analysed, it probably. Um, because underground, underground cost is probably too low, but it doesn't capture the full complexity of underground. Whereas open pit tends to, there's less, there's less things you can get wrong, so probably less things you do get wrong. And we probably are undercalling some of the costs on, on underground, perhaps. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think that would, that would be the particular, that would be the, the side of it, uh, John. But, but, um, the interesting thing though with cost modeling is, there's a positive feedback loop in all cost modeling. So if you actually get the costs wrong for somebody's operation and put them in the wrong place on the cost curve, they phone you up. So they, particularly if you, if you put them too high on the cost curve, right? So they argue lower. Now they probably shouldn't phone you up for all sorts of disclosure reasons and all the rest of it, but they don't like being put in the wrong place. So they'll phone you up and say, we're not there, we're there. And so you can then have the dialogue around them to try and work out what their real costs are. So that actually helps. Um, don't necessarily have to believe them, but, but um, so therefore you get closer and closer to the right answer with feedback in, in cost modeling. Alan, sorry. Alan, just the, um, given all the economics of an average Australian gold deposit, what depth of cover would you um, look underneath? What, 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 what would you call quits? Yeah, yeah. 100, 200, um, 50, just, yeah. just a... Yeah, no, actually it's interesting because we purposely didn't sort of put that in actually, Jeff, and I was thinking about that on the drive in this morning. <laughs> So we've sort of almost sort of um, neatly glossed over that and just sort of said it's got a, a two year extra development time and three times the grade. And so uh, on, on those numbers, it's however far you can develop in, a, in two years of extra underground development versus uh, open pit. So how deep can you get in two years is, is the answer on, on, on that one. But the, um, the nice thing about going underground, of course, there is you can then actually don't have to start building your plants until you're actually ready. Um, so you can actually be smart around your sort of capex profile. Uh, and you can right size your plants as well, so you're not left with, I know you've had the problem and I have as well, of trying to feed an oversized mill once the actual principal pits that it was built for have gone. Um, so you can be smart about the, the sort of capex. Um, we, we, I'm hesitant to give an answer because we can model it, and I can model it and give you an answer and say 600 meters, but if I change the assumption of the model, I can make that uh, a kilometer. Um, and I think there you have to then get into the geotechnical conditions. So, so if we looked at Nickel Underground and Campbell, you really start to struggle with ground conditions down at a kilometre or so. Um, in Canada, you're far better off and you get a lot deeper. So, it's a, the answer that on a spreadsheet, they would look perfectly the same. But a geotechnical override controls your costs so much that the, the, that's what starts to limit it in that particular instance. So, apologies for the not straight answer. Yeah, I'm going to politics. <laughs> I, I had one, Alan. I was curious as to your perception as to whether governments are paying attention to these things at the state and federal level, or did even have the people to understand them? Because certainly they set a, a legislative framework which is very important in the long term. It's one of the advantages places like Australia should have stability of, of regulation. Yes. But if they don't understand what they're talking about or the problems the industry faces, we're kind of in an awkward situation. No, I absolutely can. You've you hit, you hit the nail on the head. So if we took one example, let's take uranium in Western Australia. We'd love there to be a uranium industry in Western Australia, yet we set the royalty levels at five percent. And that's an equivalent royalty level to, to a jurisdiction that has far better uranium deposits than does Western Australia. So I think they don't understand. They just pick 5% because 5% is an intermediate product for any commodity in Western Australia. And basically is saying that all deposits across the whole periodic table in Western Australia have the same level of competitiveness globally, which is what that assumption is saying. And that's clearly, you know, if a first year geology student told you that, you'd say that was clearly a fake. But the government hasn't even got that far yet. So, so it's rather frustrating, yes, to try to help get the governments to understand the relative economics of different mineralization styles and different quality of assets in different jurisdictions is a lifetime's work, I think. Again, we haven't got anywhere on that really yet. Okay. Anybody else? 
one other question, Alan. Sorry. I mean, you talked about you know, so Australian media and open pit versus underground mine, and this idea of three times the size, three times the grade. It'd be interesting to sort of do an exercise with sort of a couple of porphyries and uh, what yeah, yeah a, uh, a deep porphyry would need, need to look like. I mean, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, and I realise why you asked the question, actually, uh, John. <laughs> so, absolutely. And the answer will be different, as we say, because the answer is different for nickel than it is for copper, and will be different within the different mineralisation styles in copper. And the fun one there that you can take away is that former Newcrest MD that said we can beat a three to one strip ratio open pit porphyry with our block caving underground. And that sounds really good until you realise that over 80% of the porphyries being developed around the world have a strip ratio less than one. Right, so it sounds great but you just said we'll be, we'll be brilliant in the fourth quarter. So, so you just sort of, that's not what you know, it's the same thing. Right? But yes, we can do the work and I think there if we, if we populate it with real data to, to try and make sure our models are not misleading, then that would be a really great piece of work to do. And the geotechnical side uh, and the problems of working at, at depth in heat, etc., etc., and trying to get that productivity into the, the equipment function and the labour cost function as well. It's also presumably just you know, a simple ability to get as much material out, too. I mean, you look at these large open pits like Escondida, etc., the amount of material, I mean, it's phenomenal. And I think you know, it's a struggle of can you, you know, probably can't get that same body of material out from underground. Yeah, that's right. Oh. And, and believe it or not, I mean, obviously we know about in Western Australia we talk about economies of scale, particularly in iron ore, open pits. But you can see the economies of scale in Australian gold mining, which is surprising because I'd always thought that it was hard to get clear economies of scale in, into underground mines in, in gold in Australia, but with the data is saying it's there. That's okay, thanks, Alan. That's great. Thanks, Alan. Yeah.